very pleased to um, uh, contribute to this nice um, to the nice event, and uh, it's it's good to uh, bring science to the public and uh, share you know knowledge to everybody. Um, so uh, I today I'm going to talk about to uh, I'm going to talk about ticks and uh, um, why they are a small pest and a big problem, right? But first of all, I would like to start my presentation uh, to uh, thank everybody, all the people that I work with and then they I collaborate with. They are very, uh, they are essential for for the success of my research. So I have my students, uh, the my two postdocs, uh, and all the other collaborators from Acadia, Dalhousie, Montalison University, and also from uh, across the ocean in Germany. Um, and of course, all the funding agencies that are supporting my research and uh, uh, industrial collaborators. So um, starting here. So during my studies, I have started working with insect and uh, mainly I focused on uh, uh, using natural product chemist, chemistry in insect pest management. So natural products uh, have a lot of offer and uh, they can really provide a useful biological activities to control pests. So my journey in science brought me to work with ticks. And this is for something that is very much uh, important, especially in Nova Scotia. Uh, so, I started working with ticks and then I became a tick buster. <laughs> <laughs> so this picture was taken back in the fall of 2019. I was in Mahon Bay with my two students. Um, for those that are not familiar, Mahon Bay is a beautiful touristic area that is located in the southeast of Nova Scotia. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's uh, well known for the very high population of ticks, of black leg ticks. So I was there uh, using the so-called the dragging method, so basically dragging a, a, a white uh, cloth to collect the ticks. So it was a very nice experience. We were wearing bee suits just to protect ourselves, of course, from, uh, uh, from, uh, from ticks. Um, so we were there specifically with Lisa Ali, which is the founder of Atlantic Repellent Product, and I will tell you uh, more about that later and the collaboration that I have with Atlantic. So what we will learn today. So uh, I'm going to give you information about tick identification, uh, some story about tick life cycle, so the exciting life of a tick. And uh, um, I will tell you more about Lyme disease, which is unfortunately the disease caused by the pathogen that is uh, vectored by, by black lectics particularly. And then I will try to give you uh, more information about how ticks work, so how they can detect host, how they respond to repellent. And um, based on that information, how I use all this knowledge to design a proper and novel repellent and acaricidal product. So first off, we need to learn how to identify ticks, right? So if you look at this picture here, uh, tell me which one is, uh, um, can be defined as a tick and which one cannot be as a tick or they belongs to a different type of, uh, of class of insect. It's not an insect basically. So if you, if you look at the number of legs, you can uh, easily see that ticks as well as uh, spider, they have eight legs while insect, they have six legs. So this is a good, uh, a very good indication uh, if you're dealing with a tick. So, uh, and, and this is it's funny because I get, I got a lot of calls and people contact me in panic because they think that they have a tick, but probably it's a very small beetle and it looks like a tick, but it has a six legs. So uh, when, when you look at that, you can easily identify a tick or if it's an arachnid, it, it has uh, eight legs. So, um, Ticks then are non-insect. Uh, they are the members of the same film, so they are arthropoda of the animal kingdom as insect. However, they belong to a different class. So um, there are different subphilium. So the subphilium Chelicerete includes the class of Arachnida, 
uh, which again contains uh, several classes and the subclass Acari that can be also called uh, Acaria, Acarine, Acarida, this includes ticks. So a characteristic of the acarines is the extreme fusion of the body segment, you see it's all one piece, uh, in contrast to the known three body segment, the head, thorax and abdomen. Think about it, an ant that has the head, the thorax and the abdomen. So it's easy to, to recognize that. So why ticks are important? So we can say that the medical and economic importance of ticks has long been recognized due to their ability to transmit diseases to humans and animals. So ticks causes great economic losses to livestock and also uh, they affect adversely livestock hosts in several ways. Think about it, they can uh, uh, produce less milk or they are debilitating, then they can die because of the diseases. Uh, and also they are more important vectors of diseases that affect humans, us, and also our companion animals. So we're going to learn more about tick species that can be found in Nova Scotia and Canada. Okay, so I put together uh, some nice slides with pictures that are gonna show you a little bit. Of, uh, I, I picked the most important tick species that uh, are, are found in Canada and Nova Scotia. So the first one, and I'm sure you heard about it, is the lone star tick. And uh, it's easily recognizable because the female has this nice uh, white spot, that's why lone star. And also because it was firstly identified in Texas, uh, which is the lone star state. Now, the, um, the lone star tick has been uh, uh, detected and found uh, in Alberta, British Columbia, uh, Manitoba, and more, and it's found uh, also more commonly in Ontario. But the majority of those ticks are from people or dogs that spend uh, sometimes in the uh, areas in US where it's uh, very much spread, and they import the ticks back in Canada without knowing it. So the greatest risk of being beaten by the sticks is in the early spring through late fall. And we will learn that this is a very critical time that basically uh, it's common to all ticks and uh, those ticks are those that are mostly active. So remember, early spring and late fall are the moment of the year where there is the highest risk to get uh, a tick bite. So the stick is very aggressive uh, and uh, bites humans. So compared to the other ticks, it's kind of really searching for a host and really running over a host. Um, and um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the one that is most, uh, uh, that is responsible for the transmission of the disease, as well as all the other ticks, is the female, because it's the one that actually feeds on, uh, on the host and requires blood. Um, so the other one that is very common to us is the American dog tick. So the American dog tick is um, also is very active in the fall and in the spring, but also over the summer. It's a very resistant and very resilient tick. It's very common. I'm sure you found the stick in your, on your dog, on your cat, everywhere. Uh, and uh, so although adults of females are those that are most, uh, uh, most likely to bite humans more than the nymphs. And then we have uh, our black leg ticks. So uh, black leg ticks is Ixodis capillaris, uh, is also known as the deer tick. And the greatest risk of being beaten exists in the summer, in the spring, but especially in Nova Scotia and the uh, Atlantic provinces in the fall. So the, uh, the adult ticks may be out for search uh, for a host any time of the year. So just remember, don't uh, lower your guard, uh, even though if it's winter, because if the temperature uh, is just above freezing, so we're talking about just above four degrees Celsius, you will see those sticks uh, questing, that meaning searching, try to detect the presence of a host and they will be potentially uh, biting you if you don't know, if, you, if you're not careful and wear proper repellent products and proper gear. So when you're out for, for a hike. Um, 
So the uh, all the light stages, so we have here larva, and you can notice the larva, uh, the larvae usually they have uh, six legs uh, compared to the nymphs the, uh, and the adults, they have eight. So these are all the life stages of black lectics. They potentially, they can bite humans. Uh, but nymphs and adults are the most commonly found on people. And of course, adults male do not bite, but in their final stage, they will just mate with the female, uh, which usually she's attached to a host during feeding because uh, the female ticks require the energy from the blood in order to get, uh, you know, properly, for proper energy to um, uh, feed and produce eggs and get on the last stage. Uh, so only female ticks spread the disease since only female feed on the blood of their host and become engorged. So the, the terminology uh, when the, a tick is fully uh, fed, it's engorged. Uh, and when they move to their next host, they can pass on infection, uh, the infection that they have picked, uh, picked it up in their blood meal. So looking at the three, uh, the three species here, you can see uh, particularly when they are engorged. So this is it's, it's a not, it's a not, <laughs> not a nice picture, but you can see how big they become and how much they are able to expand uh, their scudum. So this part of the body is called the scudum and they're able to really expand it to um, fill it up with, with blood. So usually an engorged, ticks, uh, engorged tick is about 200 times bigger than an unfed one. And make sure that if you have one on your dog, don't squeeze it. So use the proper tools to remove it. Um, because think about it, she's attached to your skin or your dog's skin and so on. And if you're gonna squeeze it, you're gonna sp spray <laughs> what is inside the tick into your, your skin again. So here I have also a nice picture that I took uh, with an SCM. It's called uh, a scanning electron microscopy. So it's a very powerful tool that, that can, uh, it's used to magnify the, at the micron level um, specimen. In this case, we have ticks. And uh, here I took two pictures showing you this is a black leg tick when it's un unfed and, and with engorged. And then you can see this part how smaller is in the engorged species over there. So we know very well how serious is the spread of vector borne disease, such as Lyme disease. Uh, and Lyme disease is caused by this pathogen called the Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, and uh, this is the causative pa uh, pathogen of Lyme disease. And this bacteria uh, is very happy to live inside black lectics. So they, 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 it's the perfect environment and is transmitted through a bite from a host to the next host. Now you can see from the map, this is, uh, I took this map from the uh, Nova Scotia Health website. And um, uh, I would say that in the past four years, four or five years, uh, the, um, the uh, spread of Lyme disease, or at least the spread of infected ticks in the different counties of Nova Scotia has exponentially increased. And, and uh, right now, uh, in basically all the counties, uh, they are very high risk area, meaning that uh, you have a very high risk uh, uh, probability to contract the Lyme disease from a tick bite um, compared to what it was in uh, back in 2017. So always, like I said, keep your, keep your guard on, wear tick repellents, uh, wear proper gears, and always do your tick check. So let's look at the life cycle of a black lead tick. So my, my talk will be mostly focused on black lead ticks. First of all, because it's the main pest here in Nova Scotia, and also because it's responsible for the transmission of, of uh, uh, the uh, Lyme disease that affects so many people. 
So the deer tick life cycle lasts about two years. And uh, so and tick-borne diseases naturally circulate between black ticks and wild animals. But animals such as rodents, uh, small mammals, uh, and for example, white-tailed deer, these are called the reservoirs. So the source of the tick-borne disease-causing agents. And the black ticks is the vector, so the vehicle which moves the disease agent between all these animals. Now, most wild animals do not become ill from this agent. So they are just carrying over the, the pathogen. Uh, and they cannot get, they don't become infected uh, with tick-borne disease, for example, by consuming meat or handling the pelt from a wild animal. So, but however, there is a risk for these ticks to be transferred when you handling these animals. For example, hunters, they need to be very careful because of course, uh, a deer or other animals may have ticks on, on them. So um, we have uh, these four stages. Uh, these are, the first one is the egg, which usually eggs hatch in the spring as a tick larva. So the larvae are uninfected with the disease until they take a blood meal for, from an, inf an uninfected host animal, and mostly during the summer months. So we are basically in this situation here. And then um, in the fall, then they move to, to the fall and they can, uh, um, they can prepare for the dormant, uh, to be dormant in the winter, because as soon as the temperature they go down, ticks becomes, become very much less active. And then they tend to hide and uh, um, underneath a leaf litter, and then they stay uh, in, in a very cozy situation as soon as the temperature uh, rise up again. Then the nymphs, this is in year two, becomes active in the spring and they're very angry. So they needed feed. That's why it's, it's very important to be careful as soon as the temperature rise up. Uh, so they take a blood meal in the spring and in the, or in the summer, and then they molt to become adults. Uh, and then there is the, um, the new cycle where they can uh, again, um, they mate and then new eggs will be laid and get ready to start again a new cycle. So one important thing is to remember that each stage of, or each stage of their uh, tick life cycle requires a blood meal. So once uh, the, uh, the blood meal is, is, is achieved, so there is enough energy, the ticks can switch and change to the next, the, the next uh, um, stage. So the most important, uh, the, 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 the life stage most responsible for the transmission of the bacteria and then causing Lyme disease is actually the nymphal stage. So nymphs, because they are very, very tiny, you can see here the difference. They are the size of a poppy seeds. They're really difficult to see. So um, it's really hard to actually detect it on the body. And I can tell you, I, I do biosay with ticks. I work with them and having a nymph just moving on my hand, it's very hard to feel. Like you don't feel anything about it. So it's really important that you do your tick check and you, like I said, you wear your, the right protection. Now, another important thing that this is, I hope this is will help people not panic if they have a tick attached on their skin. A ticks must be attached for about 36 to 48 hours before the Lyme disease bacterium can be transmitted. So if you go for a hike and then you go back and you do your tick check and happen that you find a tick attach on you, you just remove it with a proper tool and you will be fine. Of course, uh, it's always better to, you know, control, uh, like check with your, with your doctor for symptoms and so on. If there is, he will advise, he or she will advise if it's the case to do an, antibi an antibiotic um, treatment, but usually uh, a tick needs to be attached between 36 and 48 hours uh, before to have the transmission because it actually needs to, to start feeding. The process, it takes some time. So the uh, most humans are infected by 
NIMS, and this is mostly because we are not really able to detect ticks on our cell. And we need to remember Ixodis, so particularly um, uh, black lectics, are very much active in the cooler months of the year. So I'm talking about spring and, uh, and the fall. So when I say about tick check, um, this is really important because it will reduce very much your risk to have a tick attached on you for more than 48 hours. Uh, so ideally you need to wear long pants and long sleeves in areas likely to have ticks. And uh, thankfully right now, I, I saw that in Nova Scotia and many parks, there is always a sign to remind people to be aware of ticks. Uh, also it's important to wear light color clothing. So it's easier to see ticks uh, if they are crawling on you. Uh, wearing clothes shoes and tuck your pants into your socks is not fashionable, but who cares? It's important that you protect yourself. Um, and also apply uh, insect repellent. Uh, now you can apply insect repellent that contain DEET or picaridine. Uh, to expose skin and clothes, or you can apply other alternatives that are natural product based. Anything that is on the market, it's your choice, but please wear repellent product, it's, it's important. Uh, there are also on the market interesting uh, variation of uh, tick repellent, like, like uh, permethrin treated clothing. So there is a fabric that is impregnated with a repellent product. A new technology are coming up with something also that I work uh, on it to make um, a fabric that is uh, impregnated with repellent product, uh, natural product based uh, tick repellent. And this is a collaboration with Atlantic. So check for ticks. Here are all the different uh, part of the body that should be uh, carefully checked uh, and um, you can also, uh, it's recommended maybe having a shower right away uh, after you come back from a hike and putting your hiking clothing inside the dryer and just have it run for 10 minutes because the very dry hair will kill the ticks or at least will force them to detach and then be flushed away. So uh, I put together some nice uh, uh, fact about black ticks and Lyme disease because I found uh, talking with people and also looking at the different website. Uh, so I'm trying always to, of course, you know, I'm a researcher, so I trust very much in scientific paper and proof science. But also I look for information from the uh, government website, uh, such as CDC or the uh, Nova Scotia or Health Canada website. But also I noticed that there is so much misinformation out there that confuses people. Uh, you know, like the, uh, <laughs> the social media knowledge. Um, so first of all, there is uh, no evidence uh, for transmission of Lyme disease uh, from person to person. So for example, a person cannot get infected from touching, kissing, or having sex with a person that has a Lyme disease. Uh, untreated Lyme disease during pregnancy can lead to infection of the placenta. So I, and also I put down the slides, some papers that if you, if you guys want to go check there, I got this information from there. So the spread from the mother to the fetus is possible, but rare. Uh, but fortunately, with a, an appropriate antibiotic treatment, because remember, Lyme disease can be treated if detected on time um, with a proper antibiotic uh, cycle, we can uh, treat it and uh, uh, be, be healthy again. Um, so... Um, Although no cases of Lyme disease and be linked to blood transfusion, scientists have found that Lyme disease bacteria can live in blood that is stored for donation. So individuals being treated for Lyme disease with an antibiotic should not donate blood, just in case. And individuals who have completed antibiotic treatment for Lyme disease may be considered as a potential donor. So um, 
Although dogs and cats can get Lyme disease, there is no evidence that they spread the disease directly to their owners. However, pets can bring, of course, infected ticks into your own whole yard. So consider always protecting your pet as a um, preventive way uh, other than protecting yourself uh, as a good way for tick control. Uh, you will not get Lyme disease from eating a squirrel meat. I don't know, although people eat squirrel meat. <laughs> um, but, or, for example, eating deer meat that is, uh, that, that, that is infected with Lyme. But in, uh, in keeping with general food safety principle, always cook meat thoroughly. So uh, note that hunting and dressing deer or squirrel may bring you into close contact with infected ticks. So, uh, but there is no credible evidence that Lyme disease can be transmitted to air, food, or water, or from the bites of mosquitoes and so on. And ticks not uh, known, that are not known to transmit Lyme disease include the Lone Star Tick, the American Dog Tick, and the um, Rocky Mountain Wood Tick, and the Brown Dog Tick. So the other ticks, uh, they do not transmit Lyme disease. The only one that it's been reported to be the ideal uh, vector for the bacteria, for the pathogen, is the Black Leg Tick. So dog may develop Lyme disease from the bite of a black leg tick, uh, which might transmit the bacteria. Um, so usually when a dog can, uh, uh, it's ill, they can, they can, be, can become a feverish and lame uh, in one or more joints. Um, but the, there, is, um, there is a deadly manifestation of Lyme disease in dogs that is called the Lyme nephritis. And it's a fatal effect that is the, uh, that cause the animal's kidney to fail. But there is a treatment. So antibiotics are the way to properly treat uh, Lyme disease in dogs. And uh, similarly, um, we have uh, cases where uh, Lyme disease is present also in cats. And by the way, this is my cat over here. Um, so the, it's more frequently in dogs, uh, more than cats, uh, but there are also cases, of course, uh, that uh, you can have uh, infected cats and they show very similar symptoms. And you can see that it takes a long time for the bacteria to actually show. And this is, it's been also observed in humans. So in some cases you have the so-called um, the bull eye rash, uh, which is a typical um, uh, visual uh, uh, hint that is telling you that you got with, uh, bitten by an infected ticks. But sometimes, people are experiencing symptoms so they can take a long time. So uh, it, it's, it's similar in also in pets. Um, so many cats don't show noticeable sign despite being infected. Uh, but the, and again, same, similar thing, ticks needs to be attached for at least 48 hours. And a good way is the treatment, which is antibiotic. Now, although a vaccine is available to protect dogs uh, against Lyme disease, no such vaccine has been developed for cats. And we don't have yet a vaccine for humans. I mean, there are uh, studies ongoing. There is, a, a, I believe, there is a vaccine in a clinical trial at the moment. So there is a, a promising evolution in that. So hopefully we will have a vaccine soon for protecting us against Lyme. So what happened then if you got bitten by a tick? So worst case scenario. So we have spray ourselves, we wear clothing, but then we got a tick bite. Well, don't panic first. Um, there are different ways that you can act. Uh, as I said, first of all, uh, you need to have the tick attached for a certain period of time before to assume that you have the pathogen transmitted. You need to remove the tick using, uh, there is a proper hook that you can find in any pet store uh, to properly remove the ticks and not squeeze it. And especially you don't want to have the tick with the mouth part stay embedded in your skin. So I'll show you, this is a nice picture. 
then my student took, this is a means, and this is the mouth part with the pedipalps. And the mouth part, you can see that has all seared. So once it is inserted inside your skin, you need to be very careful when you remove it because the mouth part is like an anchor inside your skin and you don't want to have that part to stay uh, in, a, in a, uh, attached to you. Um, then when you remove it, you can save the sample and can be sent for testing. Now, Nova Scotia province does not provide tick testing because they are assuming that all ticks are infected. And it's kind of the true because all the ticks that are in Nova Scotia, there is a high, high percentage, a high probability that they carry the bacteria. However, there is the option that you can send the sample to Montalison University, to Dr. Beth Lloyd. Uh, I, I collaborate with her. It's, uh, she, she's, uh, uh, she's uh, very passionate about studying ticks and particularly Borrelia. So you can click here on the link and uh, um, you can send the sample and the ticks can be tested to see if they have the bacteria. Now, testing is really important because it will help us to better understand the spread of the infected ticks. So we have an idea about the area uh, and the um, probability of you know, infection in ticks. And um, it's been interesting, now it's, people are more aware about it, but uh, I'm talking about not much long ago, so four or five years ago, that only three to 4% of cases of Lyme disease have been detected in Canada. Uh, but if you look at the number of infected dogs, you understand very well that this uh, percentage doesn't really sum up. So um, the, uh, the number of Canadians who have Lyme disease should be much more higher than the official report. And is unfortunately a big problem, especially for the patients that have been struggling uh, with the medical provider to uh, explain their symptoms and uh, uh, try to uh, get proper treatment, uh, but they were misunderstood. So there is no really a clear communication between the health system and the patients affected with Lyme. Hopefully things are changing because like I said, there are lots of advocates, uh, lots of people that have been uh, struggling with this disease. And uh, I hope really that this will change and people will get proper treatment. Another way uh, that it's important to kind of detect and uh, uh, monitor the uh, tick population, it's this new uh, initiative. It's a, a new citizen science tool that aims to ensure more people are equipped with the knowledge uh, by helping Nova Scotia identify the ticks they find and whether those ticks pose a risk of their health. Because I mean, if you're dealing with an American dog tick, you, I mean, they also carry the disease, but it's not Lyme. So you are more aware about it. So this particular uh, app uh, called eTIC has been developed initially by Dr. Jade Savage from Bishop's University. And there are other collaboration now, it's all around Canada and it's a fantastic success at Acadia, Dr. Kirk Hillier and Dr. Dave Shuttler. They are uh, the responsible people that they work with ETIC. So ETIC identifies ticks based on photos that users submit, as well as information they provide about where they found it. So uh, this is, um, it will give us a map with all, all the location where all the ticks are found. And it's, it's, it's a super cool thing to do. And it will give you, first of all, it will give you the tool of knowledge and will help a researcher to map the, um, the tick population and, and the, the spread of a specific tick species. And you can imagine that with climate change and global warming and uh, the uh, he heading to a climate that is more humid and more, uh, you know, likable for ticks, uh, we are going to have a, a very um, in increment of the tick population all around Canada. So how ticks then find their host, the, the, main, uh, the, the main topic. So we're gonna move a little bit more on the uh, tick side, uh, uh, try to think and uh, act like a tick. Now, ticks cannot fly or jump. So instead they wait 
patiently for a host to pass by, resting on the tip of grasses and shrubs in a position known as questing. So they are waving their, their, their four tarsi here, and this particular activity is called questing. Now, while questing, ticks hold on leaves and grass by their lower legs. So they hold their upper pair of legs outstretched, waiting to climb onto a passing host. And when a host brushes the spot where a tick is waiting, it quickly, quickly uh, climbs abroad, uh, aboard and then find a suitable place to bite its host. So that's why when you go for a hike, and you have, you know, like in a trail, there are brushes, there are bushes, there are vegetation. If you're going and passing along, they might be ticks over there waiting for you to pass by. But there is also another fascinating aspect about ticks. So they are almost totally blind. So they don't really see much. Some ticks are more blind than others. Uh, black light ticks, they can see shadows, they can see light, but vision is not really their forte. So they can smell us very well. So the olfaction is the main tool that they use to detect host. So uh, ticks very, uh, rely very much on olfaction and they use a unique organ that is called the Haller's organs, which is located on the four tarsi. That's why they quest. So it's kind of like the day their nose on their heads, basically. Um, and uh, they detect the molecules or compounds that are really volatile from the host. Now, they are particularly sensitive and attracted to carbon dioxide. And so when we exhale, um, sweat and body odor, and ammonia odor, so like pee odor. And you can understand that ticks dislike other odor that are repelled too. So an important part of my research, uh, which is focusing on the development of tick repellent product is actually understanding how ticks detect odors. And this idea gave me the opportunity to work with an amazing team uh, formed by Lisa Ali and Nancy Thompson, which are the founders of Atlantic Repellent Product. Uh, it's a, a company uh, located, started in Mahon Bay, so it's a Nova Scotia company, local company. Um, so together with another uh, prof at Acadia, uh, Dr. Hillier, so we started to collaborate with them. We got different funding and support, particularly Ken Lyme was a big uh, part in our research. So we, we worked together to um, uh, study ticks and develop effective and environmentally friendly tick repellent product. And we started working together back in 2017. So we did, we did some exciting field work to monitor tick population and test some new uh, developed tick repellent product and a caricidal product. So caricidal means a product that kill the tick while, while repellent they just you know, move them away. Um, so here there are my students, Vincent and Laura, that we are uh, using the dragging method just to see and uh, um, assess the tick population. And this was done at the Morton Center, which is an art and environmental science center that belongs to Acadia University down in Lunenburg area. But also, but for our uh, lab test, we use the infection-free ticks because we uh, don't want to bring infected ticks in the lab. So these are infect, infection-free ixodes scapularis. And these are ticks, and it's funny, uh, that we purchase. So we buy ticks from a lab in US. And those ticks are really expensive. Like each ticket cost me five US dollars. And I order every time 500 at the time. So you can see that tick research is expensive, but this is what we use in, in our lab to test for repellency uh, for biosay. And then we want to measure basically uh, if and how much ticks can smell specific molecules and how we can do that. So basically we have developed a system that is based on, it's called electrophysiology, where 
I'll, I'll try to explain easily. We hook an electrode to the thick nose, uh, so the allers organs, um, and we measure the electrical activity when a tick is exposed to a certain stimulus. So if the tick will smell that particular um, uh, compound or molecule, we will have an electrical signal. And we have developed different setup. So uh, we use um, tungsten electrodes or we put a tick squeeze between two flat electrodes. So among the tested chemicals, I have measured the tick response to molecules that ticks like, such as the smell of stinky feet. So we collected <laughs> volatiles from stinky feet and molecules that the ticks don't like, for example, essential oils. So here I have, let's see if I can play this video. So this is a way how we actually tested repellency. So we have this bioassay. You can see it's a, uh, uh, this is called the horizontal bioassay. And we have applied a repellent all around here. And we basically, we're looking at the, uh, the ability of the repellent product to confine the ticks inside the inner circle. So if the ticks don't cross, means that they are repellent. So this is, was actually a good way to assess some of the product and the formulation that we were developing um, using, of course, so this is lab condition. So the idea of this project was to initially assess the uh, validity of the Atlantic repellent product, and then from there, starting and formulating new repellent product, always, you know, natural product based. So we, um, this is, was for advancing the company through the registration. Uh, so we are uh, very close to the uh, finalizing the registration of one of their product. And this is done through Health Canada PMRA because in Canada, every product that you claim to be, you know, repellent, for example, for mosquitoes or ticks must be properly registered. And, uh, We've been pretty, pretty famous. So we've been on the Chronicle Herald, CBC News. So it was a good, good uh, advertisement also for, like I said, to make people aware about ticks and the uh, transmission of, of, of pathogen and Lyme disease. So the threat, the threat of the disease transmission has led to an increased demand of an effective and environmentally friendly tick repellent product. And as I mentioned, a good example is given by natural products. So people are more concerned of what they put on their skin and uh, the uh, synthetic repellent, uh, what synthetic repellent may cause to the environment uh, by accumulation and so on. So people tend to the, the request a more environmentally friendly repellent product. And some good alternative is offered by essential oils. So, but as I said, finding a proper tick repellent product uh, and a, a, a product safe to use uh, requires that we know very well how the tick chemiosensory system works. So actually what's the mechanism behind the process of the chemical information that the tick has when it's in contact with a repellent. So as I mentioned before, ticks are smelling through the allers organs. Uh, so there are all these sensilla located here. They're responsible to interact with those uh, chemicals. And uh, it's very much a new frontier uh, in, in this field and no much study has been done so far because most of the research has been focused on mosquitoes. So on the uh, chemiosensory system of mosquitoes, but no much ticks and uh, species like this one. So the, um, it's not really clear if uh, ticks can discriminate between a repellency due to olfaction or also contact and chemioreception because also some ticks uh, from behavioral bias say they seem that they are, yes, they are repelled, but the most of the repellency might uh, be when they are getting in touch with the skin or the, of the host. 
So recently, actually, pedipalps, which are basically located in the mouth part, uh, have been described as a multimodal organ that is involved both in olfaction and gustation. So uh, these are important information that can help us to uh, understand how ticks works. So I'm going to tell you a little bit what we do in my lab and the, the main question that we try to answer here. So I hope I'm not gonna be too much technical. So first of all, we wanted to see with, what, what are the main tick volatile attractant and if there is a correlation with the chemistry and the type of, uh, and the ability of ticks to detect this volatile organic compound and also, what happens when a, a repellent is put on in place? So uh, when a repellent is together with the attractant and how the repellent impact the ability of ticks to detect uh, attractants. And if the repellent exposure has a long lasting inhibitory effect of ticks. So it will leave the ticks unable to smell us for a long time. So what we did was, first of all, to identify key host volatiles. Uh, they're responsible of thick attraction. You can see here smelly shoes that are put in uh, turkey bags where we are collecting volatile organic compound using a, te a technique called dynamic headspace collection. And then we also collect volatile from cat and dog earwax and also socks. So we are trying to collect volatiles that might be um, uh, attractive to ticks. Then we uh, analyzed what was inside this compound, this mixture. And here is the, um, the uh, GCMS spectrum from Sandy the dog here. So we collect the earwax of this, our volunteer here. Um, and we detected different compounds. It might not say anything to you, but some of them are very much uh, commonly found in uh, body odor, uh, and th they are also used as a target, as a chemical target, chemical cues, for example, from mosquitoes. So all blood feeding arthropods, they are indicating that there is a potential host around. And then, we wanted to measure basically the tick response. Remember when I told you about electrophysiology? So basically we use a machine called the gas chromatograph. Uh, it's a gas chromatography, this, the technique, where we inserted, we injected all our mixture from you know, socks volatiles, shoes volatile, ear wax, and then all the individual component will be delivered on the tick nose, the allergic organs. And if the tick smells something, an electrical signal will be generated. So we will know if ticks smell that particular compound. So here there are my students, Vincent and Laura doing this. So this is all the apparatus. So what we found that was quite interesting, we tested also different um, uh, size, so with different molecular weight of carboxylic acid and aldehyde. So these are also volatile compounds that are produced by host and they are responsible for tick attraction. And what we found, it was quite interesting, that ticks, there is a specific trend so there is a, a response when the compounds are pretty small and particularly ticks like the very much the C5, which is a, a butyric acid. So the C4 and C5. So one of them is butyric acid and this carboxylic acid smell like cheese, has a very, very strong smell like cheese. Cheese and ticks love it, just love it. So this is an indication that the um, the um, uh, the size, so the chemistry behind the, the molecule is also linked to the ability of ticks to actually smell this compound. And similarly, we also found uh, that the response was uh, related to the the size. Uh, when we look at aldehyde and the response was variable. So here there is, uh, there is not a very much 
trend here, but we saw that small aldehyde were actually inducing a response. And here the plot basically it's represented in millivolt. So we measure the electrical response of ticks. Another interesting trend is we wanted to see if the tick response uh, to an attractant would be impacted by the presence of a repellent. So we recorded the electrophysiological and behavioral response of ticks uh, towards binary mixture of repellent and attractant. So we basically mix a repellent, uh, sorry, an attractant with increasing concentration of a repellent. And what we noticed that the ability of tick to smell decreased when the concentration of the repellent increased. So there was a sort of an inhibition of the olfact olfactory system in ticks. And when we tested the response in bioassay, we noticed that basically when butyric acid, the cheese smell compound that ticks like very much, when it was mixed with uh, the repellent, in this case is phenethyl alcohol, ticks were not able to distinguish between uh, nothing while well, they were very much attracted before. So this is, it's given us uh, some idea that ticks might be, the olfactory system of ticks is impacted when uh, we mix with a repellent. Then we ask, uh, what if we expose the tick for a long time uh, to repellent? Let's say you are in your hike and then you wear your repellent. And then the tick just happened that it goes on you. So you're wearing a repellent, but it's not strong enough to actually make the tick jump off. So the tick is there and he's smelling the repellent over time. What is gonna happen? So what we did was doing a pre-exposure and after exposure. So we wanted to measure the tick response to a selected attractant before and after the exposure to repellent. And we use lemongrass essential oil and DEET as a, you know, the, the common, the well-known repellent uh, used by everybody. So from the pre-exposure, we basically, we measure the response of ticks to all of this. And the only one that induced a response that was possible to measure was butyric acid. But what happened when we exposed the tick to this repellent? So we did fumigation assay, meaning that we put the tick in a vial, we apply one of our treatment, which was uh, lemongrass, DEET or nothing. And after that, we measure the ability of tick to respond to the attractant. And what we notice is that when the tick was uh, we give butyric acid after the exposure of lemongrass, the tick response of really decreased. So lemongrass was the only one to actually give a permanent inability to the tick to smell it. So that one was quite cool. And then we wanted to check from a behavioral assay point of view, if this would have impacted the, the tick response. So my student Chelsea here, she did exactly the same experiment, but in this case, she tested the tick behavioral response in Y-tube biosay. You can imagine why it's called the Y-tube here. Um, so she uh, measured how the, 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 tick, the tick decision, if she wanted to go, towards the butyric acid or towards the control before and after the exposure to repellent. And what we saw that pre-exposure, the ticks uh, will go mostly to the attractant, but after the post-exposure, when they were post-exposed to lemongrass, they actually didn't like it us anymore. They went on the other side while the control and the it didn't do anything. So again, this is something that was quite interesting to us because we clearly saw that the exposure to, uh, in this case, essential oil would 
somehow change the ability of ticks to uh, respond to attractant. So what we have learned here, um, that volatile organic compounds uh, are commonly found in potential hosts, and there is a correlation with the chemical structure and the ability of tick to, ticks to detect this volatile. And um, there is the, um, the ability of ticks to detect attractant uh, uh, delivered together with repellents is significantly reduced. And the exposure to repellents, for example, essential oil, inhibited the capacity of ticks to detect attractants afterward. So all this information help us to design uh, proper tick repellent development. Uh, we published a work using basal essential oil that was in combination with a silica-based carrier. This is well, very good to repel uh, ixodiscapularis, so black lactics, and also we tested on the American dog tick. We developed some green zinc oxide and nanoparticles, so, so these are uh, environmentally friendly product that help to deliver, um, you know, natural products uh, for tick pest management. Or also we use a yarrow essential oil, this beautiful blue color to make nano motion, and we tested for repellent and acaricidal activity. So in conclusion, uh, so first of all, I think you, <laughs> I, I, I think I stressed that enough. So be aware of the presence of ticks, wear proper clothing and proper repellent product, protect your pets, do always your tick check after outdoor activities. And if you have a tick, uh, remove the tick and save it for testing. If you don't feel well, always talk to your doctor to get proper medical advice and always rely on certified sources for info. So government website and scientific studies. And I hope that you enjoy my talk and I take any questions. <laughs>